have a system right here, and you have a system right here, and the enemy is anywhere in this area. Our okay? mission here in anywhere RCE in East is security force assistance. So we do train, advise, assist the Afghan security forces. And that involves advising them and training them and assisting them on the battlefield when they need it more than our own combat operations. With that mission in mind, where's the primary emphasis? It's evolved to be more training and advising than assisting. So we assist by exception. The Afghans don't need that much assistance. The Afghans are actually leading this fight and they don't need that much help on the battlefield. So we do more training and advising, which are things that happen before they leave the, the gate to the base. But you still have troops out in kinetic areas. That's true. So uh, for the most part, uh, probably 94% of all operations are Afghan-led, and of that, more than 80% are uh, Afghan unilateral. There are no coalition forces out there with them. So we're out there probably only about 10 to 15% of the time, and we're behind them. We're in an assistance role, and the small percentage, the 5 or 6% that are left over are our own self-defense operations, our own retrograde, our own con resupply convoys. That's about 5% of all the operations we're doing. This is still a dangerous place. You've, you've lost troops here. Well, yes. We've lost uh, three soldiers from the 10th Mountain Division on this deployment and uh, three Special Forces soldiers. It is a dangerous environment. It's a war. And so even on that small 5% where we're protecting our own bases and in that small 10 to 15% where we're assisting them on operations, we've sustained some losses. I've talked to a number of commanders that have been in your position in previous times, and they've all told me that the war for Afghanistan is going to be fought and won here in RC East. What's your take? The main part of our effort here in Afghanistan started in the East in 2001, 2002, after we came down from the North and, and uh, freed Afghanistan. The fight has been in the East ever since. Uh, I believe that is true. I think this most, the greatest threats to Afghanistan's future come from the east, from the safe havens in Pakistan and to Kabul, the Haqqani network. Uh, the small element of, of al-Qaeda that remains in Afghanistan is here in the east. So I, I believe those commanders who you've talked to before are right. Uh, it started here, it will end here in the east. So are the threats that you have here in RC East primarily Taliban or is it the Haqqani network? It's a mix. Uh, but predominantly Taliban, but we have the most uh, lethal strain of Taliban, which is the Haqqani network. Uh, so they're part of the Taliban larger network, uh, but they operate from uh, north Waziristan uh, and to the north of that and to the south of that a little bit all the way towards Kabul. When you see a high profile attack in Kabul or anywhere in between Pakistan and Kabul, it's probably the Haqqani network. You also have previous experience working in Pakistan which has always been a, a bit of a factor here in Afghanistan. Will they be a challenge to total Afghanistan success in the years ahead? I think uh, the problem with Pakistan is they're allowing safe haven for the insurgency that's affecting Afghanistan. And uh, they really don't have good governmental control of the tribal areas in the west. And so there are insurgent networks that have safe haven there, and those networks operate into um, Afghanistan from there, and they have freedom of action from there, and that's, that's the real threat. So whether that's by you know, plan or design or whether that's just they can't control it, I don't really know. I just know that it's a fact of life. On a personal note, I've learned that you have Afghan heritage. That's right. Have you ever brought this to the table? Do the Afghans know? that uh, you have Afghan blood? Does it help? Um, I, I don't really bring it to the table. In fact, I, I, uh, I don't really bring it up. Some of them know about my heritage. I'm half Afghan. Um, I was raised by, I was adopted in Europe and raised by an American military couple as an army brat. Uh, so I didn't really even know that I was Afghan until I was about 30 years old. Um, so there are some Afghan leaders here in the military and the government who know uh, that I'm half Afghan, and it's kind of like our little private uh, joke or secret between us. I don't really try to use it to my advantage, and it doesn't really come up that often. That is absolutely fascinating. There, there are a few of the uh, senior Afghan leaders who will call me cousin, who will call me nephew, 
and some of the other Afghans kind of have a quizzical look on their face, and I don't know what they talk about when I'm not there, but uh, it comes up every now and then. Sir, you've been here a number of times. You've had a lot of experiences in Afghanistan. You've seen changes. How would you describe some of those changes? So this is my fourth uh, tour in Afghanistan since this war began. When I got here in 2002, no kids were in school. There was no army. Uh, there was no police force to speak of. We operated with warlord militia forces. I came back in 2003 and 4 with the 10th Mountain Division again. We uh, stood up the first, very first Kandaks of the Afghan army. I came back in 2010 and 11 with 101st. And uh, that was during our surge. And uh, there were a lot of Afghan forces, but there were a lot of coalition forces here, a lot of American forces here. We were leading combat operations, and we were bringing the Afghans with us. Since I returned three months ago, the d change is amazing. Not just from 2002, but from 2011 when I left. 94% uh, of the operations were American-led in 2010 and 11, and today it's 94% are Afghan-led. There are 350,000 Afghan security forces. There are two complete Afghan Army Corps in, in RC East, almost 82,000 Afghan security forces in RC East. So we've recently had presidential elections. What was the impact here? I think they went incredibly well. I think they went better, actually, than almost anybody hoped they would. We had uh, 270 attacks in RC East on that day. I was here for the last parliamentary elections in 2010. And we had 380 attacks. So we had 110 fewer attacks this time. And you might think, well, is that really progress? Well, yeah, it is. And here's why. The Afghans handled it all by themselves. It's common knowledge that good security brings stability. Stability generates a stronger economy. Are you seeing that here? I know Jalalabad has always been strong, but are you seeing it elsewhere in RC East? Well, certainly. You know, uh, there are some people who say that the economy here is actually fueled by the war. And that's probably true to some extent. Uh, but there is, there is undeniable economic uh, progress and growth here in Afghanistan. Uh, you mentioned Jalalabad. Jalalabad is a thriving, bustling city. One of the most active m markets or bazaars uh, that I've seen anywhere in this country. Kabul. Uh, you could fly over Kabul in 2002 and count the lights. Uh, now you fly over Kabul and it looks like a western city at night. It's so lit up. Uh, host city, uh, Ghazni city. Ghazni city for the last year was named by the Islamic world as the center of Islamic culture for 2013. They had a number of festivals and events throughout the year. And in February, at the end of February, they had a closing ceremony. Uh, that was attended by thousands of people, uh, people who came from around the world to attend the ceremony, and it was secured entirely by the Afghans. And uh, there were no security incidents in Ghazni uh, in the end of February. So that's an example of, I think, uh, the, abil the Afghans' ability to secure themselves and the economic progress you see here. So with all of this progress and this good news, where's the challenge? There's still plenty of challenge, right? So the first part of the challenge, I think, is there is an enemy out there who wants to actively undo it. There's a cunning, determined, implacable enemy out there that wants to undo all this progress. So that's the first challenge. And the Afghan security forces are the first line of defense for that. They have to solve that problem for the people of Afghanistan. I think the second challenge is, is all this sustainable? We've put a lot of effort into it. It's taken a lot of work by the coalition. Uh, it's taken a lot of funding by the coalition, so we've got to keep some of that up. I think we've got to keep a helping hand here with the Afghans to help them get this where it's sustainable. So if you would project out for me five years from now, what do you think we should expect to see in this part of Afghanistan? Okay, uh, so I'm a military man and I don't like to make predictions five years in, in, into the future uh, because part of my brain always th thinks about the worst possible outcome but I'm also an optimist. Here's what I believe. I believe that if we have a successful runoff election, if we get a bilateral security agreement between the people of Afghanistan, the government of Afghanistan, and the Western world, 
uh, if the West coalition leaves a advisor force here to continue to train, advise, and assist the Afghans, and if the world continues its uh, commitments to fund this effort, uh, I predict this country will be better off one year, five years from now than it is now. Sir, you're a commander. Talk to me a little bit about your military force here. Yeah, I'd just like to uh, remind the people of uh, the coalition and specifically the Americans back home that uh, their sons and daughters are over here involved in this fight and doing the, United, the work of the United States, the work of NATO, the work of the international coalition. And uh, the peoples of our countries ought not to forget that their soldiers are over here uh, doing their bidding here in, this, in Afghanistan. Do you have a sense that they have forgotten? Well, we lost a soldier uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I was reading about it uh, on Facebook. And I saw a comment uh, written in by someone who said they were, they were surprised. Uh, I thought we were out of there. That's what the comment said. Uh, we're drawn down according to the plan approved by the United States, the plan approved by NATO, uh, but we're still here, and the American people ought to be aware of that. I'm curious. We've had 12 years of war. You've been here for a good portion of it. What do you think is going to be the lasting impact on us as a society? On American society, you know, I hear people say that the American public is war-weary. Uh, pro probably no one has more of a right to be war-weary than the American Armed Forces. I think the American Armed Forces are willing and prepared to do whatever the nation needs done. Whether this war, where we can, whether we continue here in Afghanistan or things need doing elsewhere in the world, uh, America's Armed Forces are ready for that. Um, I think probably we'll be a little hesitant to get involved in ground combat uh, in the future, maybe rightfully so, uh, but I also think this. We're the United States of America, and uh, I don't remember who said it, maybe it was Churchill, but said that uh, you may not be very interested in war, but war is certainly interested in you. And when you're the United States of America, things find us. Sometimes we just have to do things in the world. America's armed forces have to be ready for that. These days back in the States, the headlines are filled with stories about PTSD, soldier suicide, sexual misconduct, uh, the shrinking of the force. What do your soldiers think? What's the impact on them? Uh, I hear our soldiers talk. They ask me questions about the drawdown of our military. Now, they believe that there's such a thing for the United States as too small of an armed forces, and I believe that there is. I don't know what that number is, but there's such a thing as too small. I've been reading some of this about PTSD and, and these kind of things. Uh, there, there's, I've read recently uh, comments by two Marines that I know and admire, uh, General Mattis and General Kelly. Now, both of them have recently talked about this uh, phenomenon where uh, some in our society are trying to make out that our service members, particularly our soldiers and Marines who have seen ground combat, are somehow victims. Or, you know, ticking time bombs. I don't buy any of that. There are soldiers who are casualties of this war, physical casualties. There are soldiers who are emotional casualties, mental casualties, spiritual casualties of this war. But those numbers are pretty small, uh, and my, relatively speaking, and my experience is that most soldiers come through their combat experience stronger. They emerge stronger down the road, and I think they'll be stronger Americans whether they stay in the military where they return to a civilian society, I expect that most of our veterans will become leaders in uniform and out of uniform. I believe in this thing in a, in a growth experience, and uh, I think by and large, most of our service members will emerge from their combat experience stronger.